Hello and welcome to iNerdius and another video in my series on what is science fiction. In this episode, I want to talk a little bit about some of the ideas expressed by Katherine Kramer in her essay, Science Fiction and the Adventures of the Spherical Cow, in the first issue of the New York Review of Science Fiction from 1988. And I read this a long time ago and decided to reread it for this series of videos. And I took a lot of notes, as you can see, a couple of pages worth of notes here. And I just wanted to go ahead and start with the two questions that she opens the essay with. What does science lend to fiction that is important enough to have a genre called science fiction. What does science fiction do with what science gives it? So the primary thrust of her article is really talking about what differentiates so-called hard SF from the rest of the genre. And she establishes this idea, which I think is not necessarily incorrect, that hard science fiction is considered by many people to sort of be the heart of what science fiction is supposed to be, the heart of the genre itself. And if you hear any noise, uh, that's not me talking. It's this puppy that I am fostering, and she just got spayed, and she's wearing a cone, and she's kind of bouncing around in the office here and scratching. <laughs> I thought it was kind of interesting. So on the one hand, she does sort of establish uh, in one sense that Science fiction is basically something that you consider science fiction when you see it. And that's, you know, that's not necessarily inaccurate either. But of course, being, being a nerd, I like to delve a little deeper into things. And so I wanted to get into why or what is it about the relationship between science and fiction that makes it science fiction. And that's kind of what she gets into here. She states that she's going to start with science and then work towards fiction as opposed to the other way around, which is work back from fiction to science. So like, what is it in this piece of fiction that is sciencey enough to be able to call it science fiction? Whereas she's saying, here's some science, now how do we take this and turn it into or utilize it in fiction? And that begs the question, of course, what is science? Which is, you know, not a small question, right? And she talks about what is science in a very interesting way. The, the first thing she talks about in terms of what is science is essentially whatever we consider to be a scientific concept, let's say, whatever we consider to be a scientific hypothesis or theory can be somehow ultimately connected back to mathematics, can be represented mathematically. And the true scientist the one who isn't just an observer of science or a tourist in the world of science basically has that mathematical background, that ability to talk about science, to understand science in terms of the underlying mathematics. However, that mathematics is expressed or whatever type of mathematics is, that is used. And for the purposes of this video, I am including statistics in that, although she doesn't specifically say that that's what she's talking about. I would also include, say, the um, the equations, the chemical equations that are used to describe molecules and, and so on. So she's, she's basically saying science is whatever can be represented mathematically. And everything else that talks about science that doesn't include mathematics is essentially a watered down version of what the actual science is saying, okay? Now, I'm not gonna argue one way or the other whether or not I think that's accurate or that's what science is. I'm just rolling with what Katherine Kramer says here. She is the daughter of the physicist, I think his name is John Kramer, uh, and he is a, a fairly uh, well, or was a fairly well-regarded physicist. He actually also wrote a science fiction novel that I read called Twistor, W sorry, spelled T-W-I-S-T-O-R. Really interesting and cool uh, science fiction book uh, talking about an idea that he had um, in the realm of theoretical physics. He's starting off with what is science with this, with a joke. 
that uh, she is familiar with. This is a joke that experimental physicists tell about theoretical physicists. A theoretical physicist loses his job at a university because of budget cuts and has to take a job as a milkman. If you're not familiar with what a milkman is because you're very young, a milkman is a person who used to deliver fresh bottles of milk every morning and pick up the empties to be washed and refilled. I think that actually still existed when I was really, really little, but I don't remember actually seeing it myself, but that's what it is. A theoretical physicist loses his job at a university because of budget cuts and has to take a job as a milkman. After weeks and weeks of doing nothing but delivering milk, he cannot stand it any longer and decides to hold a colloquium. He assembles all the milkmen in a room, and after they have all taken their seats, he walks up to the front of the room to the blackboard. Drawing a circle on the board, he says, consider a spherical cow of uniform density. And she goes on to say that the primary humor of this joke is that it describes the experimental physicist view of the theoretical physicist, that the theoretical physicists seem to exist in a world of meaningless abstraction with no bearing on the realities of experimental physics. And that's actually something that I've, I've seen uh, written about uh, in other, in scientific journals, psychological science journals about the psychology of science. And so it's kind of fascinating that um, that's kind of being reiterated here. The, the, the point of the joke, the other reason it's funny, as she states here, is that all scientific explanation is streamlined metaphor for what is the case, for what is real. So she's talking about how the abstraction and reality can diverge, how they can be different, but yet also how the abstraction can be useful, right? So obviously there is no such thing as a spherical cow, but in order for the physicist to generalize uh, his or her ideas mathematically uh, or to present them mathematically, you need that sort of spherical cow of uniform density for them to you know, be able to say the things they want to say about cowness, let's call it. So the idea is that scientific generalizations are innately metaphysical, right? They are descriptions of what is physical. They themselves are physical or they exist in reality, but they are not what is. It's a combination of, uh, if you've heard the, the concept of the, the idea of a map being a representation and by its very nature, a map is inaccurate because if a map was absolutely 100% accurate, it would actually be the place that you are trying to get around in and really would be pointless to have because you would actually have the place itself and there, therefore no need for an exact duplicate of the place to use as a map, right? Hence the idea that in a scientific representation, you lose some information, you lose some data as to uh, what's, really, what's, really, what's really going on um, and what's really being described as opposed to what is what the description is. You've also probably heard, or if you haven't, there's a phrase called eat the menu, right? The food described in the menu is a very, you know, inaccurate um, representation of the actual food and is not the food itself, of course. Um, and therefore, you obviously can't eat the menu. If the menu were an exact, absolute, 100% accurate representation of the food, it would actually be the food. And therefore, you would be able to eat the menu. Science is a metaphor for what is, right? It's a metaphor. Interesting, because fiction is also a metaphor. So she writes, scientific generalizations are metaphors for what appears, based on mathematical relations between the data and the theory, to be the case. So an example that she gives for that is um, saying that light is a wave, and also light is a particle, and there is a mathematical justification for stating that. On the other hand, light is a rose is not mathematically justified. There is no mathematical jurisdiction within which the concept of light is a rose exists. So, that, so after what I just said, she writes, one presumes that if the milkman theoretical physicist continued on with his talk, he would explain the mathematical utility of assuming for the purpose of argument that this particular cow is spherical and has uniform density. It is from the rules of mathematics and of formal logic, the latter considered here is a subset of mathematics, that scientific metaphor derives 
its apparent firm bond with reality and hence are often mistaken for reality itself. Uh, other people reading about this may start to think of what they're reading about within the, within the confines of, of the actual scientific description as opposed to considering it as a metaphor. I think that's what she's saying here. In the complete absence of mathematics, scientific metaphors are no more and no less meaningful than the statement, light is a rose. And that's really important. That's really important for her definition of what science is. When scientific ideas and formulations are invoked in a text that does not make use of mathematics in appropriate amounts, the text relies upon the existence of other texts which do. Someone who has read only the text without the mathematics cannot fully manipulate the ideas gleaned from that text unless the reader can reconstruct them on her own unbound from the fetters of mathematical convenience, which kept her a creature of the mind, kept her from being a creature of the world, and set free to graze where she wants, the spherical cow becomes a creature of mythology. When cut off from mathematics, scientific theory becomes a form of folk wisdom. So for Katherine Kramer's definition of science, you have to have that connection between the theory and then the reality, and that connection is mathematics. And anything that, any, any text that describes that theory without the, the utilization of mathematics is essentially uh, some, form of, uh, some form of folk wisdom, let's say. Now, interestingly, she did point out mathematics in the appropriate amount, which means that, yeah, it could include some basic mathematics, that oftentimes when you read some of those books, the writer will say, look, if you're not into the math, you can skip over this and the basic ideas are still there and they're including that math for those of us who feel like we can handle it and want to try to understand a little more deeply what's going on, right? And I think that's really fascinating and really interesting. Um, I would argue that like in, let's talk about chemistry, if you are looking at the, uh, the chemical equations of molecules and reactions and interactions and things like that, mathematics is only one, one route to truly understanding what's going on. The other route would be experiment, would be actually seeing what happens as described within that, uh, within those equations, basically. But that's a little bit of an aside. So, so here we are, we're talking about, we're trying to talk about what you know, what makes hard science fiction hard science fiction, and we're defining science um, as basically a theory connected to reality via mathematics. So then I would say that um, science, the science used in science fiction is myth, folk wisdom, if you will, except that the myth connects to another text, maybe another text and then another text before that even, which connects back to the to a text that has the underlying mathematics as part of the description. So in this way, science, the science that's used in science fiction um, provides an effective illusion, effective being my word, of realism and rationalism. So in, in the way that science is portrayed. So what does that mean exactly? Um, Kramer connects science to specific definitions, the science used by the science fiction writer, I should say, to specific definitions of reason and rationalism. Uh, and she says, the most relevant portions of the definition of realism, and these come from the Oxford English Dictionary, are the scholastic doctrine of objective or absolute existence of universals, which Thomas Aquinas was the chief exponent, belief in the real existence, this is B, belief in the real existence of matter as the object of perception, also known as natural realism. Also the view that the physical world has independent reality and is not ultimately reducible to universal mind and spirit, which would be idealism in, in, the, in, in philosophy. Or three, so 1A and 1B is what I just mentioned, close resemblance to what is real, fidelity of representation, rendering the precise details of a real thing or sense. So those are the definitions of realism that she says are relevant to what we're talking about.
in terms of rationalism, she basically states that uh, the, the relevant ones and the ones that actually contrast with what we just talked about in terms of realism to a certain extent are uh, the first one's theological, the practice of explaining in a manner agreeable to reason whatever is apparently supernatural in the records of sacred history. Next, the principle of regarding reason as the chief or only guide in matters of religion or of employing ordinary reason to criticize and interpret religious doctrines. And then finally, in terms of, it, of a metaphor, a theory opposed to empiricism or sensationalism, meaning what you sense, which regards reason rather than sense as the foundation of the certainty of knowledge. He's basically saying that what applies to science, what are most applicable to science, are the, uh, the doctrine of objective and absolute experience of universals, okay, makes sense, and then 1b, belief in the real existence of matter as the object of perception, also the view that the physical world has independent reality and is not ultimately reducible to universal mind and spirit. So there's a real world out there, even if we can't, not, even if we can't accurately I, uh, perceive it or represent it or whatever. And then the third definition of rationalism is, again, a theory which regards reason rather than sense as the foundation of the certainty of knowledge. So reason is interesting here. So what she's saying in terms of rationalism here is that what you can, what you, what you perceive may not necessarily be what's really happening. And you need reason to sort of get to the bottom of what's really happening in terms of rationalistic thought. Okay, so, so then she adds that the inclusion of science in science fiction requires that the rationalistic glue of mathematics be stripped from science. Makes sense. Oftentimes anyway, at least to make it readable. So that it may be properly included in the text, i.e. so the science may be properly included in the text. Because if you go too close to the way it's presented in science, it's all mathematics basically. Maybe with some description about what the mathematics is talking about. Because science fiction is a subset of the non-naturalistic fictions and involves events that provably have not happened or will not happen, or at the very least are highly unlikely when one reads a work of science fiction, and this all makes a lot of sense, one has necessarily put aside the various pools of realism and rationalism. Science fiction, even hard science fiction, must be evaluated not as science, but as art. So in that sense, what she's, what she's saying here, definitions of realism and rationalism that apply to science as, as portrayed in science fiction are like this. The realism of science fiction is a close relative to photographic realism or of socialist realism in painting. This is what motivates science fiction's occasional rejection of stylistic sophistication in journalistic prose. Unornamented prose, rich in scientific detail, has the ring of truth to the modern ear. Which leads to this, this, this definition of rationalism, which is the practice of explaining in a manner agreeable to reason whatever is apparently supernatural in the records of sacred history. So this definition, as she writes, suggests that rationalist theology is science fiction's grandparent on the side of supernatural literature. Uh, this is what motivates much of the excessive world building in science fiction, right? So, and, and fantasy to a certain extent. It is in fact not rationalism, but rationalization. So you're creating, you're doing this world building to make everything look as close to, to mimic science-y stuff as much as possible, but it is not actually science here. And so that is important because basically what she's getting down to here is that science fiction, the, the science in science fiction is just ideas that do connect to other texts, that do connect to other texts, that do connect to other texts that describe or are metaphors of reality written in mathematical terms. But the science fiction, the science in science fiction is so far removed from that, that it can't really be considered science by that kind of, uh, that kind of a definition. It has to be considered myth. And then 
the trappings of science are sort of uh, utilized to give it that feel that when you read it, oh, this is science. And so it requires a familiarity of the way that science is actually described among scientists. And so the sort of uh, the, the, the implication to a certain extent is that, you know, to a certain extent anyway, right, that only, only a scientist can write science fiction that incorporates science as close to what real science is. And that may or may not be true, but that's kind of one of the implications here. And that world building is part of that process to a certain extent. So what she's saying here is that science creates the character of the spherical cow. Science fiction writers then create the adventures for the spherical cow. And of course, what she states here, the spherical cow is an absurdity, and the adventures of the spherical cow are even more absurd, but because of the way things are presented in science fiction, readers can suspend their disbelief. And she makes an interesting uh, comparison here. As surely as earnest rational Christians can assert the truth of the virgin birth. So to recap a little bit, what Kramer is saying is that science fiction uses rationalization to sort of mimic the rationalism that scientists use when determining if the evidence of a theory and in the way it ties, the way mathematics ties it to reality, if that works. Data, the crucial information with regards to the metaphor and how it connects to reality has to be there and is and is um, arrived at through the use of reason as applied to the uh, the evidence and its connection to the mathematics. So there's still a little bit of a psychological move going on, right? The idea that. Mathematically, we're talking about this thing called gravity, but there's still a, a leap to connect the mathematics to what we're actually observing. In science fiction, whether it's hard SF or not, we are taking that leap and not, not necessarily connecting it to the crucial information that is required for science. That's what brings it to the level of of a myth, right? And um, as she writes, at its best, sci-fi tends to be about the emotional experience of discovering what is true. So again, it's the human experience, the, the emotional experience. It's what matters, yeah, the interesting ideas like in Mission of Gravity or in the, um, the short story Nightfall, any cool science idea that is used in science fiction doesn't really matter unless it has an emotional impact on, I would say, the, the characters, the main character, and also the reader. And so the way that uh, it looks like science and the way that it is presented as science depends on, of course, the cultural realities of the time, the cultural um, depiction of science. So in hard SF, especially classical hard SF, you have a very... Um, positivist, you know, deterministic, um, technophiliac, technophile way of looking at things. Paul Anderson puts it, science, technology, material achievement, and the rest are basically good. In them lies a necessary, if not sufficient, condition for the improvement of man's lot, even his mental and spiritual lot. And then in differentiating hard SF from the rest of SF, he said, a hard SF story bases itself upon real present day science or technology and carries these further with a minimum of imaginary forces, materials, or laws of nature. Okay, so a minimum of is subjective, right? I mean, who's to say what is the correct amount that results in a minimum requirement? I guess a science fiction writer um, like Paul Anderson might be somebody, something of an authority in that regard. But anyway, you know, and then she points out that later on, um, even though the futuristic voice tends to be optimistic, it has blended surprisingly well with the 1980s apparent pessimism in uh, cyberpunk. So that's interesting too. Now, a couple of other things. The What matters is the voice, right? So the voice of science fiction has to present itself in a way that seems like it's legitimately presenting 
something scientific, whether it's through the voice of a character who is an engineer or a scientist or somehow aware of the scientific trappings of what is involved in the world that was built by the writer, or the character just lives in a world that is then described through their experiences in such a way that we acknowledge that there's some interesting science-oriented things happening here, speculatively speaking, of course. That's what makes it science fiction. She does actually do a comparison of um, some of the new wave stuff versus the hard SF stuff and actually makes the argument that the new wave stuff contains just as much science as the hard SF stuff. It's just not voiced, presented in a manner that makes it feel like it's being talked about by somebody who is talking about science. <laughs> Instead, they're talking about the social effects of what's going on in the story or what's what, what happened due to the world building, you know, that kind of thing. And so we come to what I think is uh, the way you connect science and fiction to make science fiction, right? Uh, Kramer has established science is a metaphor. And the metaphor, in this case, being the spherical cow. And the, uh, the, the fiction writer also creates a metaphor, the metaphor in this case being the experiences of himself, herself, the writer, in the use of the character, which could be the character who experiences the spherical cow, as it is, as the spherical cow, in terms of like the logical consequences of having a spherical cow or what it represents. And so the metaphor for fiction is the metaphor of life. The metaphor of the subjective experience of a, of a person, of a human being who is reading reading the, the novel, and maybe also the writer, let's say. And so you combine these two metaphors, the metaphor of science in the instance of the spherical cow representing reality, in this case, because of it being used in science fiction, you know, multiple times removed from the mathematical metaphor of reality that the scientist uses, and then in fiction, the metaphor of, of human experience being uh, utilized from the viewpoint or viewpoints of fictional characters that allow the reader to experience those, those events, those experiences as if they were doing it themselves up to, a, up to a point. So that's where you combine those two and you get science fiction. So she didn't really talk about the metaphor of fiction. She talked more about the metaphor of science. I found it very interesting. Anyway, uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments, if you found this interesting or not, what you think of Katherine Kramer's idea of, of science fiction, or at least the science part of science fiction. Uh, and, uh, you know, anything else you have to say in the comments, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.